A dress that lights up. Marlene Dietrich wanted one. She described a design in detail back in 1958, but it's taken this long for technology to catch up. Berlin fashion label Electro Couture has created the dress and decked it out with modern LEDs. Incorporating digital technology into clothing is still just a niche in the fashion world. Founder Lisa Lang shows me how to send a text message to the dress, telling the LEDs to change color. Give it a try. First type hashtag. What's your favorite color? It looks like you've chosen white, is that right? The dress basically responds like a cell phone. You send a text that bounces up to a satellite and back down again. It's all data. It doesn't matter if my dress is communicating with the internet, a microwave or a car, or if my clothes communicate with each other. My dress can even tell the washing machine which setting to use. Technically, it's all possible. It's just a question of getting people to accept it. These tech fashion dresses need batteries and cables, but they're still fully washable. Prices for these outfits, however, are high, up in the five-digit range. For me, fashion is a kind of user interface design. I can build up an emotional connection with someone and take away their fear in the process. A lot of people are afraid of technology, especially since they're unable to control it. The human fear of turning into a robot is somehow hidden in the word technology. And that's where fashion can help. Some elements of the garments are made in a 3D printer. And there's plenty of other high-tech involved. Fashion designers of the future may well have to be computer programmers as well. That's me, or at least it's my avatar. I'm viewing mixed reality, a merging of real and virtual worlds. I'm watching myself interact with a new environment, and it's all in 3D. You have to imagine that a specialist is in Germany and his colleagues in China have a problem. A colleague in Germany can put on these mixed reality glasses and view a digital representation of the facility in China. And the colleagues in China can also put on glasses and view an avatar of the specialist in Germany. That means they can follow him and see exactly what he's doing from a variety of perspectives. That means I could potentially run machines on the other side of the world, with just these glasses and a couple of gestures. And a bit of practice, of course. The technology is certainly impressive, and it could make our lives a lot easier. Maybe the next generation will ask why people had to fly around the world to get things done. Here in the town of Lindau on Lake Constance in southern Germany, the car industry is doing research. Cars are learning to drive themselves. Ideally, in the future, human drivers will never have to intervene at all. It's a complicated task, and autonomous driving is still in its infancy. When you try to teach a computer to do things that you can do without effort in everyday life, then you notice how much processing power humans are capable of on a daily basis. The first step is getting the car to see and to recognize what it sees. That's more complex than I had ever imagined. Here we see a short-range radar sensor. It recognizes anything metallic, cars, crash barriers, large and small vehicles. What about children? It recognizes them too, but not nearly as well. It's especially good for metal. Step two, accurately interpreting the data and using it to recognize complex traffic situations. Will the child jump out onto the street or not? I can't imagine how a machine could handle that one, no matter how many examples are fed into its software. On the other hand, humans are responsible for an awful lot of accidents. It would be better to let those drive who make fewer mistakes. 
whether humans or machines. The verdict on that is still out. <laughs> bowling is a real highlight here, even though the bowling balls are virtual. That doesn't seem to bother the nursing home residents. Computer games are a welcome new addition here. <laughs> Many of the seniors in the home suffer from Alzheimer's, dementia, or Parkinson's. These games were developed especially for them. They're designed to stimulate the brain, encourage movement, and distract patients from their suffering. It makes me laugh. It's funny. And it gets me moving. That does me a lot of good. And I like to ride motorcycles. You can see there are lots of games to choose from. We try to cover every type of movement. A Hamburg startup came up with the idea to start using computer games in nursing homes. The games are all controlled by movement alone. Doctors and psychologists help develop them. Now it's my turn. <laughs> It's the combination of motor activity with neuropsychological, cognitive and memory functions that creates an optimal mix for therapy and prevention. And creating that mix has only become possible recently. The technology needed to run multiple processes, such as scanning the room and mapping each person's frame in order to analyze movement, has been available for several years. But not long ago, it was much more expensive and complicated. The company founders have been passionate gamers since childhood. They want people who play their computer games to enjoy life again. Technology is helping to make that possible.